Good morning, Grace Community, New Life Christian Church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. I'm going to be reading a scripture in your hearing from Matthew 28. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you in Galilee. Therefore, you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by his feet and worshipped him. Amen. 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 Come on, church, I want to invite you to stand. We're going to rejoice in our risen Savior today. Amen. Come on, put your hands up with us. One, two, three, sing. Let everything...
Let everything, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Come on, lift up a shout. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior laid on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah's death and dawn. Oh, 
place, can we just start to exalt the name of Jesus? You rule, you reign, Jesus. Come and sit on the throne of my heart, Lord. Lord. We deserve all praise, Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that your name is the highest name, God. The name above all names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. So we declare that you are Lord in this place this morning, God. We declare that you are Lord. Over sin, you conquered death, you conquered the grave. sickness and death. You conquered depression. You conquered anxiety. Thank you, Jesus. We speak your name. We speak your name, Jesus. As we lift your name, let every other name bow to the name of Jesus. Let every other name bow to the name of Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Come on, we're going to sing. Let every knee. Let every seated. That was for the two stragglers. So, glory to God. Oh, it's so good to be here. Is that awesome worship? Hallelujah. It's Easter Sunday morning. How glorious. What a day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I, uh, it brought me back to years ago as a uh, pioneered Grace Community Church called Grace Assembly of God at the time, and and worship was different, and they had a lot of the old songs, This is the Day, and stuff like that, but then in 1991, Hosanna Music came out, and, and it changed the landscape of worship music for a long time, and it's continued to just get better and better. Can I get a witness to it? Amen. I... I'm so thrilled to be here. This is our, our second joint service. We did March 10th, and this is so awesome to have Easter with grace and new life together. Amen? Hallelujah. <laughs> Pastor Tony's going to preach in just a little bit. <clears throat> I said that to encourage him. That... Uh, Next week is their final week here, and uh, Grace, you'll be back at the uh, over in Marver Marvin Avenue. But then after that, we're going to be. This is our home, and we're going to be here. Excited, just excited about about that. Hallelujah. 
I want to read these words. It's so fitting for today that Ron Canoli wrote this. It's called Jesus is Alive. For all the earth had trembled, the sun had hid its face. For all and all the men that walked with him had turned and run away. They crucified. Alive, death has lost its victory and the grave has been denied. Jesus lives, he's alive, he's alive. Let's say that, he's alive, amen. He's the Alpha and Omega, the first and last is he. The curse of sin is broken and we have perfect liberty. The Lamb of God has risen, he's alive, he's alive. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. The stone they threw away is the cornerstone today. Death has no more victory and the grave has no more sting. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Wonderful counselor, a mighty God is he. The everlasting father, he's the precious prince of peace. He's the word that lasts forever. He's alive, he's alive. Hallelujah, Jesus is alive. Death has lost, lost its victory and the grave has been denied. Jesus lives forever. He's alive. He's here this morning. He's here. His presence is here. The Holy Spirit of God that dwells in Jesus dwells in each person that's received him as Savior and Lord. If you've never done that, it's really not a big process to it. It's just saying, Lord, I want a change in my life. I want to become like you. I want you to do something in me that I can't do myself. And I ask you to come in. And that's as simple as it is. For whoever asks, receives. Whoever seeks, finds. Whoever knocks, the door is open. It doesn't take you going through a whole litany of, of explanations of why you don't deserve him. You're just, he's alive, and he says, I'm so glad you're here. Hallelujah. If that relates to anybody here, maybe we're all saved, and it's a glorious thing. Hallelujah. I, <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 10, 1, Jesus gave his disciples authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. But John chapter 10, I'm sorry, John chapter 17 and verse 18 says something else that applies to us. Because we could think, well, that's great that they got to cast out demons and heal the sick and raise the dead. What's that got to do with us? I'm glad you asked. John chapter 17, verse 18 says, As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may be one in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Isn't that awesome? What's he saying there? He said, it wasn't just the disciples. It wasn't just the apostles. It was the people that would hear the message through them. And that's what we have. It goes from generation to generation, as long as we'll be those people that are going to share the word of God, that we tell other people. His spirit is in us. The power that raised Christ from the dead is resident 
in every believer. Amen? And we have a few things that are necessary today. I want us to pray for an anointing of the Holy Spirit to come for divine healing. Uh, <clears throat> Sherry right here uh, has a son that had a tragic uh, <clears throat> affliction that left him a quadriplegic for eight years. And uh, he's the bravest guy you'll ever meet. Uh, he can't talk. All he can do is look up and down to answer questions. He can answer yes and no. And it's really, it's incredible. And Sherry's been on a roller coaster ride for many years, and he's back in the hospital. And I want to see the resurrection power of Jesus in Jimmy Schneider this morning. Amen. We have someone else that also in the hospital uh, that checking out a, a blood, perhaps a blood disorder or anything, but we just believe in God to wipe things out. Jesus gave us the authority, so I want us to use that authority. And if you have something that you're dealing with, you can receive that healing touch as well, even by just making a faith declaration over yourself, something like this. Thank you, Jesus, for paying the price for my sin and my healing. I receive that right now. And speak it over yourself. Believe that God can do that. It doesn't take bells and whistles. Amen? It just takes faith. Would you stand with me and let's just pray for these things? Just everybody, just stand for a moment. Hallelujah. Father, we join together. You said where two agree as touching anything they may ask will be done by our Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Because we're asking in your name. So in your name, Lord Jesus, we speak over Jimmy. Jimmy, be healed in Jesus' name to rise up from that bed and have this affliction broken off of you. Lord God, we just release your anointing and pray that we're going to enter into this realm of your spirit to say yes to you, believing you, taking you at your word. Do it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The others in the hospital and those here that need that healing touch, we just say, be healed in Jesus' name. And I say, Lord, I receive it for myself, and I thank you for what you've done for each one of us in the name of Jesus. Can the church say amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated. Hallelujah. Let's welcome Pastor Tony Coburn. Morning. What a morning, huh? Praise God. Through whom all blessings flow. Yeah, amen. Well, listen, um, I may not look at externally of being excited and full of joy and happy, and that's because I'm part German. <laughs> but the other part is Italian, so I'm a bit schizophrenic. Sometimes I'm very stoic, and then sometimes I'm a little crazy. But whatever the outside looks like, inside, I'm full of joy. I could not be more blessed. And I know my wife feels the same way, that we are so happy, so joyful for this moment that the passing of the baton is going on to Grace Community, Pastor Ray and Debbie. We just couldn't be more thrilled. We just couldn't be more satisfied. We just couldn't be more joyful. And it's not a sad thing. You know, people keep saying, are you sad, are you sad, are you sad? And I feel a responsibility to say, yeah, yeah, we're sad, we're sad, we're sad. <laughs> <laughs> but I also feel like it's not the whole truth, you know, because I'm not that sad. What's to be sad about? Our part has finished here, and it's, it's going on. You know, 
people change, but God's purpose doesn't. He just brings in other folks to fulfill it. And we're just thankful that we were part of it and could be part of it and will be part of it because as it continues to go on, we'll continue to be part of it just in a different way with a different function. And so we're very excited about that to see what God is doing. And on that note, I just want to share a little bit of history so you can once again be convinced that this is God, not that it needs to be because I think we all sense it in our heart that it has to be. It has to be God. But way back when uh, this church was birthed in this capacity as a rock church, our pastor was approached to come and start a, a ministry here. And uh, he had an apostolic mantle and established churches all over. And he came and he prayed in the old building. He wanted to make sure that it was of the Lord. And he said as he was kneeling and praying, he looked out the window and this uh, parking lot was overgrown, just uh, very thick and with a uh, underbrush. And as he looked up, he saw children going down into that area in, in the darkness. And who knows what was going on there? We know it wasn't good. But he said the Lord spoke to his heart and said, the reason I want you to start a ministry here is for the children. For the children. And through the years, we've tried to, you know, walk in that VBS and all those kinds of things. And uh, it was just wonderful as I looked at this front row to see all the young people, all the young people in this in this church. And I want to share something else that coincides with that. And uh, years ago, we were down in Rock Church Convention. That's where we were ordained. We were part of that. And Bill Hammond was there. How many know Bill Hammond? Pretty credible prophet. Been around for a long time. He was prophesying over people. And when he came to us, he said, uh, you're going to have a youth revival. And it shook me to the core. It was like, oh, no. <laughs> That's scary. And uh, he said there will be a young person who will kind of be uh, very vital in, in recognizing when this is going to happen. Through the years, we've carried that in our heart, but we've never seen it fulfilled. And I was thinking this morning, you know, Sometimes we don't understand prophetic words, and sometimes we may possess them as though they belong to us. But God's word is eternal, and he may prophesy over one person, and if that person in their lifetime or in their ministry doesn't fulfill it, it doesn't mean that it went away. And I believe that prophetic word is still resting on this church. And I think what we see today with the young people and Father's house was established for that, and I know Pastor Ray has a vision for it. He just sees it, you know, he's going to take it to the next level for sure. You guys are taking it to the next level. And that does our heart good because that thing has kind of tormented me that we didn't <laughs> see that or facilitate it. But God is faithful. He said it. He spoke it. It's going to happen. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. I want to share this morning on the resurrection. Fancy that. The Lord has been impressing upon me just maybe in the last couple of weeks that the resurrection needs to become more dominant. Uh, maybe that's not the right word, but more preached and more... Uh, looked at, if you will, in the same magnitude that we embrace the cross. And it's the cross is so much easier because it's a visual. We see them all over. They're on churches. They're, you're riding down the highway. You see them. People wear them around their neck. And the cross has become a symbol of Christianity, and it's always in view. It's always in front of us. And so we always recognize it and realize it. But just as important 
of the cross, as the cross is, and please hear me this morning, uh, we don't have to marginalize one to lift up the other. We can value them both with the same intensity. And I think that's what the Lord is wanting to do with us, is to embrace the resurrection with the intensity and the sincerity and the faithfulness that we embrace the cross. Because it's the, the resurrection of Jesus that validates the cross. One can exist without the other in, in the purpose of God. That's why the hierarchy and the religious crowd so desperately to uh, cause the cross to be a non, uh, the resurrection to be a non-entity, to wipe it out of the minds and hearts of people. The enemy thinks he's slick and he has schemes, but he only plays into the hand of God. Fortunately, the religious crowd were so paranoid that Jesus would rise from the dead. They uh, had a Roman guard posted to make sure that the disciples wouldn't come and steal the body because without a body, it meant that the people would believe that he rose again from the dead. So fortunately, they did that as a proof that the Roman guard was there, that the disciples or no one else came to steal the body because the Roman guard, that was a very serious thing. They took it very serious. They didn't fall asleep. They didn't, uh, they, they performed their duty under the penalty of death. So in the enemy trying to uh, prevent, he, he gave us a, a evidence of that it could only happen one way, that there was no scheme, the disciples didn't have a plan, it was the plan of God, and death could not hold Jesus. Why is that important? Because if Jesus did not rise from the dead, that means that he wasn't the Messiah. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, it means sin has not been paid for. We are still under the wrath of God and the debt of sin. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we would have no hope. We would have no hope. And it means that he was just either another human or that as the Messiah, somewhere along the way, he sinned. Because if he had sinned, he would no longer be the spotless lamb. If he had sinned, he could not pay the price for sin. If he had slipped one time in all of his walking on earth, not only in action, but in thought, just one bad moment that he didn't respond correctly or one thought that was ungodly, he would have been unable to pay the price for sin because he would just be another sinner. That's a big thought. So the proof that he was the spotless lamb the proof that he is the Messiah is that death could not hold him. There was nothing in Jesus that the enemy could hold on to. And it's proof for us that because they couldn't find the body, and they tried, I remember seeing a, a I don't know how factual it was. It seems to be pretty factual. One of those movies where it was talking about the resurrection and how the, the uh, Jewish religious group were desperately trying to find the disciples. They were sending out the Roman guards and the, uh, the guards for the uh, Pharisees. To f they had to locate the body. 
They had to find the body. They were sure that if they found the body, that this whole resurrection thing would be void. But they couldn't find the body. Thank you, Lord. The message is we must embrace the resurrection to a greater degree than we have. I think it's time, wouldn't you say? Sometimes, you know, we, we excuse, I might not have the proper language all the time, and I don't mean to offend you, but sometimes we elevate the cross to the point that we neglect the resurrection. Hear what I'm saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. We can get so involved with the cross that we forget about the resurrection. It doesn't need to be. We need to hold them both in high, um, high, high faith, I think is the word. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, it's a great chapter on the resurrection and so many other things uh, that it addresses. But in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is addressing the Corinthian church with a situation that was arising amongst the people. And how many know nothing has changed? The devil still works the same kind of works that he worked in. He's always trying to undermine. He's always trying to put out disinformation so that can bring confusion and it can rob faith. And so Paul's, I believe, uh, addressing that issue. And I think it's important for us to look at this morning in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you be uh, believed in vain, unless you believe in vain. Hold on to the whole gospel. We can't go around with half a gospel. We can't go around with half of the good news. We can't stop at the cross without moving on to the resurrection. We must preach them both. It says in verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. I love Paul when he can just continues to uh, talk about the scriptures and uphold them and everything is according to the scriptures. And it says, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the 12. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was sent by James, he was seen by James, and by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. Well, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. That's a huge statement. It's not good enough just to believe in the cross. That's half the gospel. We must embrace the full gospel, and I believe the gospel was so successful with the disciples is because they're they were intent in not only preaching the cross, but also preaching the resurrection. 
And I believe, and I speak in a general sense, that we in the church, preachers, those evangelists, those who witness, we not only tell people about the cross, but we tell people about the resurrection. And we might, the enemy might say, well, that's just too hard for people to get. You know, that's, that's just uh, beyond what they can understand. Listen, the gospel is the power unto salvation. The full gospel is the power to salvation. Not a half gospel, not a gospel that we feel is relative or could be understood, because it cannot be understood except by the Holy Spirit. Because the carnal mind is not, a, it's not able to grasp the spiritual realities. So when we try to reduce it to just something that's rational or something that could be understood, we're robbing it of its power. That's why the enemy would like to put these little things in there that would cause us to hold back or fear that we can't present it properly. But we must preach the whole gospel. Otherwise, it's in vain if people don't have the faith to believe in a resurrected Christ. And you say, well, that's a high calling. Yeah, it is, but guess what? Faith comes from what? And if they don't hear, the faith can't be stimulated. I really believe the Lord is, in this day and in this hour, restoring and challenging us again to preach the whole gospel so that we can see. You know, it says in Scripture that Jesus confirmed. The words were confirmed. The gospel was confirmed. How was it confirmed? Signs, wonders, and miracles. How many are satisfied with the signs, wonders, and miracles you're seeing? Not me. One more. Guess what? So does God. God wants more. Jesus paid a high price, a dear price, for sickness and disease. He took those stripes upon himself so that we could be delivered from them, so they could be lifted from us. He, pulled, he paid a, a, a full debt. I know every one of us want to see the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. We want to see those that are stricken down to be raised up. Jesus said, you'll do these things and you'll do greater things than even he himself did. I don't want to water that down and think, okay, well, we'll have more science and we'll have more uh, people being healed with drugs. No, I don't think that's what he was talking about. I think he was talking about we were going to move in more power of the Holy Spirit. There was going to be more miracles taking place. There was going to be more people being raised from the dead. There's going to be more people walking, hearing, seeing that he might be glorified. Amen? So can we ask ourselves, why aren't we seeing? Well, maybe we're preaching a half gospel. Just maybe. Something to think about, right? Paul was very adamant that they preached the full gospel, not only the cross, but the resurrection. For if there was no resurrection, the cross has no benefit. It's all in vain. The enemy would like to steal that from us, take our eyes off it. Even today, when we set aside, and here, you know, we, we, we can't just set aside one day to talk about the resurrection and limit it to that. Paul speaks so much about it. If you go on with uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he begins to explain it. I guess part of the problem was, well, how can this happen? How can it be? What's it going to look like? John talks about, in uh, 3 John, he talks about when he comes, we will be as he is. And he was dealing with the information that he had. But please hear me again. I don't know how privy he was to the writings of Paul. I don't know when John wrote that. It's obviously uh, divine inspiration from God, but none of them had all of the divine inspiration. Paul goes into great detail about resurrection. I believe that we're going to see, we're going to understand more about Jesus as we begin to really dig in to the resurrected Christ and what is revealed about him 
and how it's going to work, a lot of answers would be settled, and I think faith will grow and will we'll have more confidence that the sting of death is gone. It says when he comes, John said when he comes, we will see him as he is. We will see and we will be as he is. I think God wants us to have that revelation of how he is, where he is, who he is, in a greater depth. Let me say it this way. You might have a greater depth. Let me say it depth in this way. He wants us to embrace the resurrection in its fullness because it reveals to us who we are in him and who he is in us. If we're going to identify with his burial, and we readily do that in water baptism, we, we go through the water baptism, and it's easy for us to identify with his burial and with his death. But at the same level that we identify with that, we must also identify with his resurrection. It's just as true. Maybe a little harder for us to grasp. Maybe we don't see ourselves as seated with him in heavenly places. But isn't that what Paul says in Ephesians? He's not saying down the road. He's saying the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you become his child, he seats you with Christ in heaven. Those kind of things that we can't touch, see, or feel, are harder for us to grab onto. That's why we must trust the Word of God and believe in the Word of God and have the faith to believe for the fullness of what the Scriptures tell us. I almost think like we have to have permission to walk in the newness of the Spirit. Through unbelief, the church has kicked it so far down the road. Someday, one day, when Jesus returns, we'll have the fullness of it. I believe we should be moving towards the fullness each and every day that we're growing in Christ. But if we're not seeing it demonstrated, we're not seeing it manifested, it's like no one's telling to us, yeah, they'll say, well, it's all true. But there's that kind of thing in there, like down the road it'll happen. I don't know. I think it's for today. I think we're waiting for someone to say, hey, it's okay. It's okay to walk in the newness of life. Not as it okay, but you should be. It's okay. You can be led by the Spirit in each and every moment. It's okay to identify with the risen Christ that you truly have died. The old man is dead. He's buried. And if he's dead and buried, the new man has to rise up. Is that not scripture? Do we not say it? Let's embrace it. Pastor Ray alluded to it this morning. It's that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you. How does, how does the Holy Spirit get in you? You're not walking down the street and he invades you. You come to a point where the gospel becomes alive to you, where your mind is invaded with the realities of God. And you're all of a sudden you're able to understand why Jesus came and who he is. And it's presented to you and his grace influences your heart. And you're able to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. At that moment, Holy Spirit is in you. In that moment, you become a tabernacle of the living God. This is a a building, yes, and when we come together, the Holy Spirit is here. But when we leave, we don't leave him. He's in us. 
Wherever we go, he's in us. Wherever we are, he's in us. He's committed to us that he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He's our counselor. He's our guide. He's the one who empowers us. He's with us. We are a temple of the living God. Sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes we wish he wasn't so close in our thoughts or actions. And sometimes we think he's not looking, but that's not the word. If Holy Spirit is in you, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is resident in you and has raised you from the dead. You have been raised from the dead. And you are seated with Christ in that heavenly place. And it's, heaven isn't a geographic place. It's a dimension. <laughs> That's another message. What are you trying to say this morning, brother? I believe in these days there's a greater revelation of a resurrected Christ that the enemy has been trying to hide, that the enemy has trying to steal because he recognizes and realizes that if he can steal half of the gospel, he can weaken it. I don't have time to read all of 1 Corinthians, but it's a good chapter for you to read because Paul goes into detail about the resurrection, about how it works. And yes, when he returns, it'll be a glorious day and we'll have more revelation and understanding and we truly will behold him and see him as he is. But it also says, as he is, we are. Can you receive that this morning? As he is, you are. If you received him as your Lord and Savior, as he is, you are. And if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is in you, he's even quickening your mortal body. Now, we know this body is decaying, this body is old, but guess what? The Holy Spirit in it is even, that's why when we pray for healing, we can pray for healing with faith and with authority because if, if the person is a believer, the Holy Spirit that is in them is even bringing life to their mortal body. Oh, Jesus, you're so good. You're so good. I'm not here to try to convince us of the evidence of a risen Christ. You can, you can look at that. You can look. You know, here's the greatest evidence. We can produce all the facts, and, and the scriptures do. But the evidence of a resurrected Lord is a changed Because if he is still in the grave, there would be no power to change you or I. How many know you've been changed? You're not the same. I believe that's the greatest evidence that Jesus is alive. He was who he said he was. He was the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He was God. He is God. He was human. He still has humanity in him. He said, you destroy this body, I'll raise it up in three days. I believe he did. I believe the Father raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand, exalted him because he humbled himself, gave him all power, all authority. And he is our God. And we are his people. 
And he wants to reveal himself so that you can understand who you are. It should be that when we look at him and the reality he is, we see ourselves. That's a cool thought. As we see him, we should be a mirror of him. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's alive. 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 The devil's a liar. <laughs> He's alive. Give him glory if you don't know him. The Holy Spirit's tugging at your heart. Just give in. Surrender. Say, okay, Lord, I want to be yours, and I want you to be mine. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We honor you today, Lord Jesus. We honor you, Father. We honor you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray that you're going to come in and Pour out your spirit upon us minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, that we'd continue to grow in grace and knowledge of you. Father, I pray a blessing over each one here to experience your presence like never before. Lord, we heard a great word this morning. We pray that it would, it would be sealed in our heart with uh, active participation in your word, in prayer, in devotion, and we're just going to thank you. We pray a blessing upon this whole day as families gather together that the resurrection power of Jesus would be in all of us and be felt in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? amen. God bless you. Happy Easter. Have an amazing day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen.